OK, well, uh, good morning. Um, one of the things that we did last time, we started talking about advanced biasing techniques, particularly in the context of integrated circuits. And one of the things that we saw is that ideally we want to make sure that our biasing networks are designed in such a way that they, they relate the bias current or bias voltage to some, so something that's less dependent on power supply or process and all those things. And we saw in that process there was one general theme so one of the things that we did was that we created these kind of stages. So we had, they could be bipolar or MOSFET. So we had a combination of a, a current mirror. Or let me just make this a little bit larger. So you have a current mirror. In this case, I'm doing it as a PFET current mirror. Or it could be a PNP current mirror or P-type current mirror. So you have a current mirror. And this current mirror, if it does its job perfectly, essentially, what it does, it forces the two branches to be equal. The current of these two branches is equal if, the bo if both stages remain in uh, pinch-off region. Now, then we added an other added element, which I call the isolator or floater. So which basically what it does, it creates an independent control of these two nodes. So what this does, it forces to... Now with this, you can have two branches here and here, reference to the lowest potential, let's say ground, or whatever the lowest potential is. It could be a negative VDD or something like that. Um, doesn't matter. Let's say it's ground for now. So you have two branches here. And what this combination did was that this upper part guaranteed, so this, was the, this is the mirror. This is the classic mirror, right? Under the right circumstances, essentially, when the devices remain in the, tri uh, in the pinch off region, they, and, and of course, if the output resistance or the channel length modulation is not excessive, these two currents are substantially the same. Now, when these two currents are the same, if you look at this stage, what this does is that if these two transistors carry the same current, right? And if they are the same size for now, let's assume. We, we saw also we can play tricks with the W over Ls of them to get around some of the limitations of this thing. But in general, let's say you have the W over Ls here and the same W over L. I mean, it doesn't have to be the same as the lower case. These two have to be similar and these two have to be similar. Um, so if you have the same W over L, same current flowing through them, which is enforced by the upper part of this network, what can you say about the VGSs? the VGSs will have to be substantially the same, right? Which basically means that since these two VGSs are both referenced to the same G, the same gate, these two voltages need to be substantially the same. So what this does, it does something interesting. It, it is what they call floating mirror. Um, so what it does, it forces these two currents, at least in ideal situations, it forces these two currents to be the equal. Or, or similar, and it forces these two voltages to be the same. Now, you got to be careful about this arrangement and, and uh, the way you interpret this. You should not interpret, if I give you a one port, basically a two terminal device, something like a resistor, a capacitor, something like that. Remember, you cannot enforce both its current and voltage at the same time. Right? Should make logical sense. Because you, let's say, I'm going to enforce the voltage, and then, you, then the device, the IV characteristic of this device, or general characteristic of this device, will tell you what its current is. Or if you enforce a current, it will tell you what its voltage is. Or you may not enforce either one. You can say, I have this kind of IV curve for my source, and then you can say, well, I ha and this guy says, well, I have this kind of IV source for myself, so let's see where we can meet. You can never, for a two-terminal device, enforce both current and voltage at the same time. You enforce the current, you, it sets the voltage. If you set, enforce the voltage, you set the current. Or you enforce a combination of the two, it will give you another equation to determine what the what voltage and current will be. Now, how is it that you can do set both voltages to be equal and the currents to be equal for two different branches here? Because really, these are two different branches. This is not connected like this. These are connected like that. There are two of them. So you have four sets of equations. I mean, four sets of unknowns. 
right? And four sets of equations. Each one of them has two equations and two unknowns. The current and voltage, and current and voltage. And what all this does, it sets two equations. That this current is equal to this current, and this voltage is equal to this voltage. It doesn't set any, it doesn't say anything about the relationship between this voltage and this current, and this voltage and that current, which are determined by what you put in here. There's no logical kind of like contradiction here, because this is two branches, not single. And it should not lead to the conclusion that you can enforce both current and voltage of a single branch. Okay? Yes? So, something that I think is a little confusing. When we were talking about the differential and single ended conversion, we had a current here in the top. Okay. And if I remember correctly, it was argued that the voltage, and it was BJP at the time, but the, the voltage across the drain and the source was substantially equal exactly because the current here was forcing equal currents. And so, in deriving the common mode, we connected. Both right. Sources in this case. Right. So in that case, you're assuming equal currents and about equal voltages, but only for this single current here. So I guess my question is. So, so let me just. Exactly okay. the extra, what would you say about? Maybe it's the assumption, but what would you say about these transistors below? How these guys? Oh, oh no! In a, in a, you're talking about a. So, so you're talking about a different stage, different kind of stage. Let, let's draw. I think. Let me just make sure if I understood your question. You're talking about a differential to single-ended conversion. Right, something like this, with a current mirror on the top. Is, that, is this the stage you're referring to? Yes. Okay, great. So, so you're talking about this stage, and the common mode analysis. And the common mode analysis for that, the argument was that the DC of this thing, if these two are forced to be equal, the DC value of this side is going to be substantially similar to this voltage. So. From, since its voltage is going to be more or less that, at that value, it's, we can assume that it, it is connected to that voltage, which basically means that for common mode perspe perspective, you can actually short circuit this. And look at this as a common mode input. Right? right. Now, in this case, for the circuit on the left, we're assuming, now I think this is a question of, I guess, what's causing what. Because on the left, we're also assuming there's equal currents. Uh, correct. But we are not doing necessarily a common mode analysis. The common mode analysis allows you to do that because you're forcing these two to be equal. So it's a, it's a subset of, of, of the possibilities, right? right? So the common mode, we're saying we're forcing the voltages uh, down below at the gates. And then right. because the currents are equal, we can say something about these voltages up top. Right. In the other case, we're trying the, the equal voltages below are what we're solving for. So we can't assume that exactly. the That's exactly right. So it's a matter of you can do either one. It's just a matter of which one are you going to choose. Uh, correct. Here, the equality of the current is really enforced fundamentally here at, in this stage, right? At the, at the input. And this equality of the current that's enforced here will result in this voltage being substantially the same as that in that analysis. And that's on, that only holds for common mode input. Because there is no, if, if you have a differential input, of course, these currents are not going to be equal, right? So it's only for that mode of operation that you can actually enforce this here. Now, here, what you're doing is, here is that these guys, their job is to enforce these two to be substantially similar. And these guys, by the way they are connected, will guarantee that these two voltages are substantially the same. So it's a different situation. So you have two branches here that are separate. In that sense, you have one branch at the bottom. That may be one way to think about the difference. The, no, I guess so. Uh, oh, they, they, you know, we, can't, we can't say they are equal. No. Right, right, right. No, absolutely correct. Yes, you're absolutely right. In fact, you can see that in general, if you think about it, they are not going to be fundamentally very cl close to each other in most cases, in the most general case. So let me just, if I may, erase this if, you, if you're done with this. Um, and so here, here's actually, let, let's just pick some typical, some, some not typical, just some numbers, right? I mean, so let's say this was 5 volts, right, for the sake of argument. The supply is 5 volts to ground. And let's say your threshold voltage is half a volt. And let's say your W over L is chosen so that your gate overdrive is 0.3 volts, right? So this is going to be delta VGS plus VT, VG, VT which is going to be 0.8 here, 0 0.5 plus 0.3. And this is going to be 0 0.5 plus 0 0.3 because they're the same node, so that's fine. But now remember, this node is at 0.5. Now let's say I put small resistors here. Let's say I put a VBE here. 
but if we get, let's, say, let's say a diode. This is going to be 0.7, right? This is the way we use. So if this is going to be 0.7, what is this voltage going to be? It's going to be another 0.8 here. It's going to be 1.5 volts above ground. This voltage is 0 .7, 0 0.8 volts below 5 volts. So it's going to be 4.2 volts. This side is going to be 1.5 volts. They're substantially different. In fact, it's actually essential to the operation of this stage for this to happen. And, and this is why we are putting this diode connected here. If I had put the diode connected on the other side, this would get messed up. This would not work. Why? Because you get 0.8 here under that circumstance. And then you get 0.7. So that basically you're saying this voltage wants to be much higher than what it would have normally been. So which basically means that now you have a tug of war between this upper, brand, this upper part that's trying to pull it up to VDD and lower part. Because you have essentially put two low impedances in series. You remember we talked about putting low impedance and high impedances? When we put this here, we, we pair up a low impedance and a high impedance. A high maintenance person is paired up with a low maintenance person. You can't put two high maintenance people at the same, in the same place, it's just like you will get into conflict. Right? So it's, uh, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, and that's a great question, in fact. Exactly. It, because and we've also talked in previous circuits about we'll send a transistor, say for the say for the current year for the BJTs, we send another BJT to supply the base current. Um, mm -hmm. And it, I, you were saying, well, it will, it will supply the voltage the right. it needs. And so there's kind of a question of what's causing what. And so here, it's a matter of knowing which voltage are we setting. Exactly. So, so the, it's, I mean, you, you asked, I think, a good question, a very good question, and you're touching upon something more broadly general, and which I've tried to address in a different context, but let me just talk about it differently. You said, what is forcing what, right? I mean, so that, that, that concept. See, we could think about them differently. We can think about it that something is forcing something else. Or we could think about it as that this is, there's nothing that actually forces something else. It's an aggregate result of a bunch of equations or load lines or IV characteristics that in conjunction together they would result in an operation point that can be constant or change with time or things of like that sort, right so I think the correct that, that well the more fundamental way of thinking about it is the latter that there's a bunch of IV relationships that kind of like interact with each other now that is not very conducive to design Right? Because you say, okay, well, basically what I'm telling you is that solve the n equation, n unknowns that in general are nonlinear, and find out what it is. That's good for a computer. That's not good for us. Now, if you're designing, we want to kind of develop this notion of something forcing something else, right? And with the understanding that the, fundamentally it is really a manifestation of those sets of equations working together. Now, the way we do that, though, the way we get around that dilemma is by noticing the notion of impedances. So low impedances are good at setting voltages. High impedances are good at setting currents. So when you're dealing with high impedances, you can say, oh, this is a current drive. When you're dealing with low, impede source, imp low source impedances, let's say, then you're saying that this is a voltage drive. Conversely, if you're dealing with a low um, load impedance, as opposed to source impedance, load impedance, then, then you are saying that, okay, it's a current sense. It's, it's better modeled as a current source, or better thought of as a current source. But there is, in practice, there's never a zero ohm, and there's never an infinite ohm. So all of these eventually kind of like, if you want to make it exact, you have to go back to those equations. But it's a way of thinking that allows us to come up with first pass solutions and then build upon the first pass solution and identify what's wrong with the existing solution to move on to the next level. Okay, so maybe in the examples that we had for the differential to the single energy conversion, we had high impedance at the gate, and so we would say it's forcing a, well, forcing in a sense the current, or driving a current, whereas here we have low impedance at the source yeah. of these, and so we would say, 
Right. I mean, in this case, essentially, you're saying you're establishing two relationships between branches and current, uh, uh, currents and voltages, but you don't say anything about explicit relationship between this I and I and V, because which is determined by what's inside this oval, which we haven't shown. Really. Yeah, but that's a good question. So, yeah, good question. Is, is this clear? Is, this, uh, is it clear where we are going with this? I mean, it's not necessarily just philosophical. I mean, because you should realize that when you talk about drive and you talk about this is the current source, this is the voltage source, this is the current drive, this is the voltage drive, these are our approximations that allow us to think about low impedances or high impedances. It's a way of thinking about impedance levels. And people generally sometimes run into this conflict that trying to kind of resolve something either mathematically accurately or physically intuitive, and they can err on one side or the other. It's, un it's important to understand that how, what, these are approximations or ways of thinking about some sets of equations. Anyway, going back to this. So what we have is we have this floating mirror configuration that allows you to contain. And this was, we used it in different ways, right? This is what we did eventually, right? You could put something here and then reflect that voltage across here and pass that through a resistor. Usually on one side you have sometimes a resistor. At least you have a resistor, right? So we looked at three different combinations of this thing. One was when, for example, we wanted to make a VT reference. We put, what, what did we put here? We said, okay, if you put a MOSFET, a diet connected MOSFET, for example, and a resistor here, what it does, it drops the VT plus delta VGS of this thing across that. And we saw that, okay, one way is to make delta VGS small compared to VT. You can make the W over L huge, right? If you make the W over L very large, then delta VGS would go to zero. You will get mostly VT. And then that would be dropped across here. So the current across here would be the threshold voltage divided by the R. And it becomes more independent of the supply voltage, right, for example. You, we saw another trick, which was a little bit more clever. He said, oh, if you make this W over L, you have a delta VGS. If you make one of, let's say, this W over L over 4, you get two delta VGS here for the same current, so you can actually kill it systematically as opposed to in the limit. Right? We did these things before. The other thing that we did, for example, was that we said, okay, we can put a diode or a diode-connected transistor. This could be made out of a parasitic bipolar transistor. And when you do do that, you're dropping the VBE across R. So basically your I would become VBE on divided by R. Now and that's determined by the total current exact value of VBE, but it's going to be 0.7-ish for a silicon transistor, typical silicon transistor, or typical currents in, in an IC, let's say milliampish. And then you can make this current be proportional to VBE. Again, it makes it more independent of supply. It doesn't necessarily make it independent of temperature because we saw that VBE and VT both had negative temperature coefficients, right? So that was one of the things. And then we said, okay, well, we, what, what if you want to make something with a positive temperature coefficient? And we noticed that we really want to get that VT out. We saw it from a detailed analysis that VBE was negative because of the influence of the IS, right? Because IS has such a strong dependence that even through the LN, the natural log, it still came out to be strong, to overwhelm, and become negative, despite the fact that you have a VT up front. But if you look at the difference of two VBEs, right? if you have a VBE1 minus VBE2, then you have VT, natural log of IC over IS1, minus VT, natural log of IC over IS2. And what we did is say, well, let's scale one of the transistors to be n times larger, and hence its VBE would be n times larger. So if you have, so this is 1x, this is nx. So, it's, so this is basically n times is1. What you will see is that basically the, through this calculation, you, this subtraction of the natural logs or logs, you basically get the natural log of n. Right? Because ICs cancel, and then you have IS2 equals N times IS1. You cancel, you got natural log. And then this difference is what's appear, what appears across this resistor, right? Because this voltage is reflected across here, and this voltage, this is VBE1, this is VBE2, so R sees VBE1 minus VBE2. And therefore, you, the current would be VT over R natural log of N, or better yet, KT over QR natural log of N. So you get really, truly proportional to T, temperature, which is what we call PTAT. And the one with, bipo uh, with uh, uh, just the VBE reference is called CTAT. 
PTAT stands for proportional to absolute temperature, CTAT means complementary to absolute temperature. And then what we saw eventually was that we combined these two. We said, OK, well, the VBE itself drops like this. So this is the CTAT, or VBE, and then versus temperature. And then PTAT is there. Now, if you give PTAT the right slope, basically put the right number in front of it, you can combine these two and add them in a way that at least at one point, they will cancel and produce a slope of 0. And, you, and if you notice last time in the equations, this cancellation is not across the entire range of temperatures. This full cancellation is really at one point. And beyond that, basically, you, you create a point which has a slope of 0. So then the temperature dependence becomes weak, and at this point, around this point, becomes 0. Because its first derivative is basically 0. And you can adjust where this point is. And then that's a first order thing. Then people do a whole bunch of other second order things to come back and adjust it to make it more flat, et cetera, et cetera, if they're trying to make it. Now, and the way we did that really was we took, for example, this out and fed it through another resistor, which is m times r. And then you pass it through another, and, and you put it in series with another VBE. Right? And this was where you generated that voltage. So this voltage is m times kt over q natural log of n. It's the voltage across the resistor, and then plus Vb. So you get this p-tat in series with the c-tat. And then you generate what we call. And you can actually relate this to band gap voltage. You can make it, if you try to match them, you can see it comes close to the band gap voltage of the silicon. It's 1 point something, 1.05, 1 1.1 1 .1 volt of the thing. So which is nice if you're trying to create a constant voltage. Now, there are, so this is one way of doing this thing, right? uh, this kind of so-called floating mirror concept. And if you want to make it better, let's say you can say, well, these things, well, what if you ha I have channel length modulation? What if I have early effect? What do you do? Well, you cascode these, for example, right? And cascode these. And when you cascode these and those, then they become better match. Now, there's a few things to think about here. There are several considerations. And there are variations on this we'll talk about a little bit today. I have a question for you about this network. Obviously, what we solved is a solution. Can you identify another solution that's a valid solution for this network? It's a nonlinear system, so it can have more than one solution. Right? Do you see another solution? It's a trivial solution. Let's put it this way. Yes. Yes. All of them zero. That also holds, right? Every current being zero is also valid. And what happens is that all of these guys will collapse down, right? So this voltage goes to zero. This whole part, this whole part will go down to zero. And this whole, these three guys will go to VDD. And this actually is a problem. Because when is it a problem? When do you think this is going, can be a problem in real design? If you design something like this, you've got to be very careful. Well, yes, Noel. How can, does the, um, is there draining voltages or the voltages are the Here? Oh, you're talking about the zero solution? How does it work? OK, so he, he, this is the way what the voltages would be. This becomes 0. This becomes VDD. This is 0, and this is 0, and everything else below them is 0. Because this makes this VGS 0, right? And this VDS will be large. This VDS, this VDS would be VDD. But it doesn't matter because its VGS is 0. Because this is 0, this is 0, these are 0, these are 0. This VGS is 0, this VGS is 0, this VGS is 0, and this VGS is 0 now. Right? And the current through here is 0, so VBE is IS, whatever, exponential, minus 1, so that becomes 0. So everything can be, it, it's, it's a valid solution. It's a stable solution. How do you think this manifests itself if you were to do this? In design, in real design. You, you make a chip, you make put this on it, you do it exactly the way we did it. How, what, what do you think will happen? 
You turn it on, nothing happens. Because this is your reference branch, right? This is what's supplying all the currents to everything else. So this can stay at zero. No current will be produced anywhere else. Nothing is biased. Everything is zero voltage. It draws zero current, which is very nice. But it doesn't do anything which is not as nice. Right? So how do we solve this problem? Propose solutions to this. The solutions don't have to be complicated, right? I mean, they don't have to, I mean, there are more sophisticated ones and less sophisticated ones, but it's the simplest solution. Can you propose a simple solution to this? Put in some sort of current source at the bottom to get it started? Uh, yes, but, okay, so that current source cannot be referenced off of this, right? Because it becomes a chicken and egg problem. You're right, I mean, that's one way. What is the simplest current source you can think of? You're on the right track, but what is the simplest current source you can make? It's very simple. It's a very simple element. A resistor, a large resistor, right? So you can actually provide, you want to provide a pathway for this thing to charge. So if one example, I mean, this is not necessarily the best way of doing it, is you put a resistor here. And it's, if it's a large resistor, it's not going to have a significant impact eventually when you start drawing current. If the current eventually through this resistor is much smaller than the current through here, that's fine. But what this does initially, since the current is small, this voltage is going to pull this up. And as soon as it starts pulling up, this, this starts drawing current, starts drawing current, it will establish itself. So in steady state, you can also do it as a switch, something that turns on when the supply turns on, right? I mean, you can make it like this. And it doesn't have to be a big device. It shouldn't actually be a big device because then the current through it in a steady state will mess things up. There are more sophisticated ways of doing this. But this startup problem is something you need to be mindful of. Because remember, these are nonlinear circuits, so they can have more than one solution. And it should be mine. So this is one way of doing this. There's another way of doing it. So what is the problem with this? I mean, if I want to make this work nicely, if make this to a cascode, make this a cascode, make this something like that. What did you see problems with this reference voltage or, or generating it this way? Let's say I've generated this 1.1 volt supply, well, volt uh, uh, reference off of this and make these nice cascodes. And do you see a problem? Headroom, right? Headroom, and how so? For example, let's say you're operating off of a one volt supply. Then your reference you're trying to generate is even higher than that. So it's obviously not going to be operating at one point. The way we are doing it, it's not going to be at 1.1. It's going to be crunched. The transistors are not operating in the proper region of operation. This volt, this is not going to be a supply independent thing because, of course, it depends on the supply. If the supply is too low, it's going to be too low. Headroom is a problem. So there are other manifestations or implementations of this thing, which are conceptually, in my opinion, the same. They may look very different. So you need to be familiar with these. Uh, so one implementation of this thing is some that looks like this. So let's say you have, you make two branches. Let's call this R1, R2, and R3. And then you put your VBEs here. Your diode connected devices or just diodes essentially. Now, what you're trying, what I'm trying to do here is to basically force these two voltages to be equal. One way to do that is to basically take this and use an op amp to drive the output. So think about what this does. If you think about this carefully, what do you see? This loop. Right? through negative feedback, forces these two voltages to be equal. And we'll talk about this, as, when we talk about feedback extensively, we talk about this asymptotic equality principle, et cetera, et cetera. But what we know from our prior courses is that if this gain is large, this basically forces these two voltages to be equal, right? And forces these two. That's the asymptotic equality principle, which we'll extensively talk about and apply at the transistor level as well as the op amp level when we talk about the feedback later on. Uh, but at this point, again, it's a little bit back and forth, but just if you think about it, this enforces these two to be equal. 
this feedback. Now, what does, what, what, does, what does that mean? So let's call this brand the current through this branch I1 and the current through this branch I2. Right? What do we know about the relationship between I1 and I2? Now, if, I force, if we force these two to be equal and this side is common, what can you say about the voltages across these two resistors? They have to be equal, right? Which basically means R1 I1 equals R2 I2, right? Agreed? So that's one equation. Yes? I think the ones and twos are equivalent to each other. Yes, they are. Sorry. Yes, so this should be I2. This is I1. Thank you very much. Um, OK, so yeah, please make that correction. This is I2, this is I1. Um, and now, that's the equ that's, so that, that equality gets. There's, there's another thing, right? We know something else. So now we are forcing these two to be equal, which, is, which makes it exactly similar to that, that guy, right? Looks flipped, because the resistor now is on this side. But other than that, you're equating these two. So you can make this times n. And this makes me times one, right? So this is just a flipped version of the one that we just talked about. The two sides are switched. But again, you get the same expression, right? So you get VBE1 um, minus VB, well, VBE2 minus VBE1 equals R times I2, no, R3 times I2. And so this one is basically VT natural log of n, and this becomes R3I2. So, uh, actually, sorry. No, 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 never mind. No. Actually, let's make them the same size, actually. Because now the currents are different. We've created a difference in current. We don't need to make them different, actually. So, so what, this is what happens. So VB2, which is this guy, which is going to be VT natural log of I1 over IS, right? Minus VBE2, or VB1, VT natural log of I2 IS. I, I think I messed up these names too. Um, equals R3 I2, OK? So what do you get? You get VT natural log of I1 over I2 equals R. 3i2, r3i2, right? But now, from that first equation, I have a relation. We have a relationship for i1 over i2. It's r2 over I r1, right? So you can plug this in, and what you get is vt natural log of r2 over r1 equals r3i2. So, or I, you can write it as I2 being VT over R3 natural log of R2 over R1. So you can see again, we created something, a current. This is the ratio of two resistors, right? If you make them of the same kind, it will have no temperature dependence, the first order. If they're close to each other, you place them close so they have the same temperature and make them of the same kind. So they basically, that ratio becomes a ratio of parameters, right? So which is good. You have a te thermal voltage, Vt, Kt over Q. And then you have R3, so that's I3. And then, of course, if you want to use the other branches current, so if, if I say, if you say, what is this current volt, et cetera, you know it. And the other question is, what is this voltage? Let's call this V out or V out, the same voltage, right? What is this, the output voltage of the op amp? Well, isn't it just this VBE plus R1? So it is basically VBE1 plus uh, the voltage across R1, which would be VT R1 over R3 natural log of R2 over R3. So you can see that there are two ratios here that you can control in your design. And by controlling them, you can set the coefficient that sits in front of the thermal voltage. So you can add it with different weights to VBE. So that would be the V out. Yes? So if, if your two op amp inputs were in balance in such a way that it just drove, it drove the op amp to its upper rail, right. 
keep going. Yeah. So that, that's a sign of the feedback, right? I mean, you choose the sign of the feedback so that it becomes negative. You can basically choose the polarity of the inputs in such a way that it goes, if, it, if in one direction it goes in that direction, if you flip the inputs. So it depends on whether R1 or R2 is? It depends on the relative sizes of these things, okay. how you choose them. But once you choose them, it's, it has one direction, one preferred direction. That's exactly right. That's a good question, actually. It's a very good question. Um, so yes, so, so that's one way to do it. Now, what's the advantage of this thing? The advantage is that you can see that the headroom problem is somewhat over, overcome, right? Because if you make this op amp in such a way that it can operate here, um, it, the voltages don't need to kind of build up a large number. But part of the problem is resolved. Still, this voltage is on the order of VBE plus some VT. And to get some cancellation, you will be at like 1.1 volt. So if you're still operating at 1 volt, this is not solving that problem. The question is, that can we solve that problem? And we'll solve it in a second. But let me ask another question from you about this. Doesn't this look a little bit like cheating to you? How is it? Yeah, it's some of you are nodding your head. How, how, how does it look like cheating? Go ahead, you. Uh, uh, Nate. I haven't really created the offset. Yeah. OK. Yeah, I was going to say, you're, you'll probably need to have you look at Yeah. Now. You may say, well, you're going to be using this to make an op amp. Then you're using it inside the op amp. So it's a recursive solution, right? And unlike programming, the in, in, in circuits, recursive solutions are not necessarily an acceptable solution, depending on how you do it, right? <laughs> because they're physical manifestations of things. But in a way, it kind of is like a recursive solution, the way the recurs recursion works, right, in programming. How does recursion work in programming? It reduces, it breaks the problem to simpler versions of the same problem. And say, well, if you want to solve the problem for a large system, solve it for these two smaller versions twice. And then for each one of them, break it into smaller things, right? So with that mindset, well, th this mindset predates that mindset, but, re but really, <laughs> you guys are probably at this point more familiar with that mindset than this mindset. But uh, this op amp doesn't have to be a fancy op amp. That's the answer. This is a very simple op amp. And we'll m mix these op amps. This can be as simple as a sing simple single ended to differential converter. So it may look like cheating, but it's not because this can be very simple. It doesn't have to be a fancy op amp with very high gain or very high other bandwidth, things of that sort. It can be a simple amplifier that takes differential input and generates an hour, single and hour. And we'll talk about this in more details. But I wanted to bring it up. Right? There's, no, there's no point in sweeping anything under the carpet. If you're going to be re doing this stuff for real, because it will come and come back to get you. <laughs> so you better know what the answer is or find out. OK? All right. So we solved one problem, apparently. At least, well, we have to still address this issue of the op amp, but hold me to it. <laughs> but then let's see what, how about the other problem of the voltage being high? Can we think of a way of? Generating a voltage that's independent of the supply voltage, really, or independent of temperature and supply voltage, basically related to the band gap. But it's not exactly the band gap, because band gap may be too high. 1.1 volt may be too high for supply voltages you're dealing with, for example. right? Can you think of a good way of generating that? Where is the problem arising from? What is the source roots cause of the problem here, that this voltage becomes 1.1 volt? Here, let's look at this expression. What is causing that 1.1 volt to be large? What, 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 what is causing that big voltage? Because it appears that I can scale this any way I want, right? By controlling the ratios here, or in the previous example, by controlling n, which is, the, again, the ratio of the transistors. So either by controlling this here, or this here, I can control the VT part, the PTAT part. I can scale any way I want. Right? We can control it by M and N, or R, the ratio of the resistors, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, the source of problem is here. right? The problem is that are, the way we are adding the VBE is direct. We're just directly adding VBE. Right? What do we want to be doing? Tell me, that, so we can develop this solution ourselves together. 
Instead of applying VB. Yes, David. Right, exactly. So you want to scale VBE, right? Exactly, as you pointed out. So you want to come up with a scaled version of the VBE to add, right? What is the easiest way to add things? I mean, we did use kind of like voltage addition, putting things in series to add things. But there's, another, there's a more natural, well, practical, more practical way in circuits to, do, to add things, which is what? Adding currents. So we need to generate two currents. One is PTAT, proportional to absolute temperature, and one is CTAT, but it's not necessarily just the VB and add these currents, right? So we need to create a CTAT current and add it to the PTAT current, and then you have a sum of two currents that have different proportions, different weights, and then you can dump it into a resistor, and that would generate the voltage you want. By scaling that resistor, you can scale this voltage. So how do we do that? Well, there are, again, different ways of doing that. Again, to demonstrate yet a slightly different way of doing this, let's show you, let me show you something else. So let's say you make a, did I do it that way? Okay. So let's say you have a resistor here, and then you have a branch with the VBE alone. So I'm trying to enforce these two to be equal. There's another way to do this, which is basically like that. So I can take my op amp, the not so fancy op amp, and apply it just simply to the gates of two NFETs. Like I said, there are many, many, many different ways to do these things. So, and then you basically do take this, and then now, so this thing, what, what am I generating here? This current, if I replicate it here. If I make a copy of this current and this, this current coming out, what is it? Is it PTAT, CTAT, something else? What is it? I want you to be certain about this, and if you're not, let's find out why we, we don't. It's proportional to the difference of the v, two VBEs dropped across a resistor. So what is it going to be? What is it going to be proportional to? Vt, right? Temperature. Do you agree? It's this calculation, right? It's the difference of two VBEs. So it's going to give you a Vt. Right? So this current is going to be a PTAT current. Now, one thing we could do is that, so, so, so far we haven't done anything new. It's just another way of generating that proportional to absolute temperature, the VT reference. What we need to do is just to now make a copy of this and drop it across a resistor to produce a current proportional to VBE. We've done this before. You can do it as a separate branch, or you can combine them. You can say, look, you know what, let's just put this away for a sec. Um, so let's say, now I want to drop this voltage across a resistor, another resistor, R2. And look, look at that current as my reference current. How can we do that? We can do one of those floating mirrors, et cetera, et cetera, but then it would require a separate branch. If I want to be more economical, I can use another feedback network, right? another op amp, and use that to drive the gate of a PFET to control that. Now, what does this do? It forces these two voltages to be equal, right? this op amp with sufficiently high enough gain, and then we'll force the voltage drop across here to be VBE, which basically means that the current across here is going to be VBE over R2, right? But now, if I replicate this voltage, if I, take, if I tap off of this voltage, and I tap off of that voltage, And I take these two and combine them. Now these don't have the ratios don't have to be the same, right? I can actually have this the ratio of this transistor to that transistor and the ratio of this transistor to that transistor in such a way that I can actually scale them in any proportions that I want, right? Correct? Because I can scale it up or down. And then drop it into a third resistor. Now, this voltage 
is going to be what? It's going to be VBE times R3 over R2 times the scaling factor for this guy, which we called it M, plus the, this current times the R3, which would be VT. Um, we said it would be natural log of R2, uh, I'm sorry, natural log of, in this case, it would be the same thing. So it would be natural log of VT of, OK, it would be VT R3 over R1 natural log of N. So we can actually make this times N, because we are forcing the currents to be equal. So I have to make this something else, K. So there would be a K up front here, and that's what you will get. So let me just clean it up a little bit. It's a mess right now. So it's K natural log of N um, R3 over R1 VT. And R3 over R2 M VBE. So you can see that I have, we have a weighted sum of VBE and VT, but I've, we've been able to scale it down by the ratio of R3 to R1. So we can actually make any voltage you want. If you want to make a voltage that's like 0.3 volts, that's independent of temperature and supply, um, you can do that. Yes? No. Uh, it's connected here. Yes, sorry. I'm, yeah, these are all just passing. You know what? Let me just do it better. Sorry, can get messy. Does it make sense now? Oh, this looks kind of like it become a looks like a transistor here. Okay. So basically, that takes a copy of this current, injects it here. So this is my P tat, and this takes a copy of my C tat, and combines them in different weights. Right? And then dumps it into the R3. You still don't look very convinced. How's that CTAT? Do you agree that this is just, I replicated this VBE here using this op amp? Right? So it's VBE over R2, this current, which is the same current as here. So if this current is going through this transistor, if I take its VGS, and drop it across this transistor, it would have a current that's proportional to the current of this transistor, which is basically this current. Now, that proportionality factor is controlled by the ratio of the W over L. So if I make this m times larger, it would be m times that. But it's a VBE divided by R2. And remember, VBE had a negative temperature coefficient. right? It was negative 2 millivolts per degree C, so that's why it becomes C tat. Right? Agreed? So this is the way you actually generate something that of any arbitrary voltage level that's constant. Doesn't have to be exactly band gap or close to band gap, 1.1 volts. You can make it anything. You can make it 0.4, you can make it 0.5, whatever. You can make it larger, yeah. So <laughs> neither, none of these. <laughs> well, the close Whittler's original design actually looks pretty more. It's essentially. It's essentially a more complicated version of this. It's a more, I mean, it looks more complicated because he's trying to basically implement this as part of the circuitry. So this amplification and gain is happening at transistor level. Here we have abstracted it away. So we can separate it to understand. So, but it was like a mess. I mean, Whitelaw has all these kind of like interesting things. Whitelaw also had this. This is back in the day, right? I mean, of bipolar transistors. Remember, BJTs have a voltage VBE on of 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 volts, right? So he took a bet. I think it was a, uh, the bet was a beer or something like that. But to make a one volt equivalent of 741, which was one of the classic op amps uh, that operated from plus minus 12 volts. So it made a one volt version of that using BJTs, which is not easy. Because you can't put two VBEs in series. So anyway, 
He was a creative designer. Whatever. Anyway, uh, so, so that's for that. Any questions on this? And there is, of course, a lot of variations of this thing and a lot of things we talked about. If you want to make the gain constant, we don't necessarily even need to have to um, make a constant voltage. You actually make, for, in a BJT, for example, we saw that you want to actually use a PTAT current to bias the BJT because then the dependence of the GM on the temperature will cancel that. We saw that last time when we talked about this last lecture. So when we, we can do that. So there's a lot of variations, and you will see some more of that in the problem sets. Yes? All right. So the current off the, the second off amp, you said like before when we waited the modification, it was PTAT, now it's CTAT again? Uh, this one is CTAT. Yeah. yeah, this one is PTAT. This branch, yes, this branch, this is, a PTAT, uh, this is a PTAT current, and this is a CTAT current, which we just basically replicated here and dumped here. So the key here, look, we, we, you could, you could, instead of doing this, you could have had a separate branch with a VBE and a resistor just copy that here. So you, this is basically just economical. You're using the same VBE that you were using, just copying it here. You could actually have a separate PTAT and separate CTAT and then combine them later. This is a more economical way of doing it. There's nothing magical about it. All right, any other questions? Okay, 